Dr. Satan is the name of the person we'll be going over today. This doctor is in fact the real Dr. Satan. Many people may be thinking of the fictional character from the horror movie House of a Thousand Corpses. However, it could be said some inspiration came from this. Marcel Petio is the man we're covering here, the real Dr. Satan. This man was a cold-blooded serial killer, stealing the hopes of innocent people and twisting it to his financial gain and murderous fantasy. This story doesn't quite get the attention as most others around World War II do though, which I do find kinda odd given it's a very dark story and it does have a lesson that comes with it. Let's talk about where this took place. It wasn't just the Nazis that brought hell to France. Marcel Petio was a citizen within the country who would bring it to. Petio had a few loose screws and he was a pathological liar. He carried the same traits that most serial killers do with a sick way of thinking and a lack of remorse. This setting is important as the majority of the crimes will take place here. The location being Northern France, specifically in Paris. When the Blitzkrieg happened, France fell in weeks, and it was divided up into three divisions by the Nazis. The Nazis would occupy three-fifths of the land. The reason for mentioning this is because Marcel was not a Nazi. Even though France fell to Germany, they didn't fully occupy it. There are two things to take away from this in the war to come, and why I bring this up. Northern France was one of the divisions occupied by the Nazis, and it's also the same region Marcel Petio resided in. Northern France at the time was housing Nazis and an internal serial killer. What's really awful about this scenario is Petio's victims were innocent people trying to escape the Nazi regime. In fact, he took advantage of the people looking for a way to escape. He disguised as an honest underground rescue location and would actually end up filling up his basement and backyard with bodies making graveyards out of these poor innocent people. Being an innocent person in northern France, trying to escape, certainly had their work cut out for him. At the height of the war, Petio would really rack up his murders, but his first one dates back to 1926. He had become a licensed doctor in 1921. Five years later, he was reported to have had an affair with one of his elderly patient's daughters. Suddenly, she disappeared. Police investigated, but this would be chalked up as a runaway, and the case was dismissed. Shortly after in the same year, Petio would run to become mayor, and won the election. Nineteen twenty-six is the first documented suspicious disappearance, and it's very possible more happened before this given there is a five-year gap from the time this happened and when he got his medical license. An important detail to share here about his medical license is that it was an accelerated program to help war veterans. Petio was mostly a doctor for soldiers with mental health issues. He got his degree in just eight months. Petio found himself in some trouble in 1931. He resigned as mayor after being suspended for multiple complaints of dubious financial dealings and theft. Like other sociopaths in serial killer history, Petio was a charmer and had sympathizers. These village sympathizers resigned with him, and one month later, Petio would be elected a counselor of the Yan department. By the way, I'm aware I may be butchering some of these names, like Yanni, or Jan, or Petio, or Petio. I appreciate you bearing with me. You've made it this long. And yeah, he has one disappearance case linked to him that was dropped, but we haven't even got to the can of worms yet. We're almost through his political details. I found it necessary to share because, again, he would continue with money laundering and stealing. He was institutionalized for kleptomania. For those unaware, it's an obsessive disorder for stealing things. Now, this was occurring in 1936, and leading up to this, Petio had been boosting up his own fake medical credentials, to the point that when he was released from the institution for his kleptomania, he was actually giving the authority to write death certificates. A lot of Petio's certificates and degrees were fabricated, but now he was a doctor in Paris, officially authorized with the ability to pronounce people dead. His own punishments were being granted with rewards, whether it be sympathizers or real credentials. 
We've discussed some of Petio's ways of navigation through his life with false narratives. And in this stage, we will go over the wave of victims he took down by using his typical deceit. From fraud, to manipulation, and to murder. His fake credentials would coincide with his real new ones, including writing death certificates. Petio set up a trap pretending to be a safe house. This disguised safe house was actually his own home. He got in touch with victims impacted by the Nuremberg race laws. Petio began offering a way out for people trying to escape Nazi-occupied France. By doing this, he would let victims know he operates with people underground that can escort them to safety. Once Petio had an arrangement with someone to escape, he would have them come to his house first and administer a vaccine to fight off the illnesses that were spreading to those traveling abroad. This, of course, was a lie. Petio was injecting people with poison while they were under the impression they were getting a vaccine for their travel. After murdering his victims within a soundproof constructed home, Petio would take all valuables from these people and place their bodies in a basement furnace. Due to the amount of people coming up missing and Petio's name being a point of contact, the Nazis arrested him under the suspicion of working with French resistance. This couldn't be further from the truth, he was stealing people's opportunity to safety. His arrest took place in 1943, and after a few months he would be released by the Gestapo without releasing any true information of his murders. It wouldn't be long after this that France would be liberated in 1944. Over 20 people had went missing after arriving to Petio's home. This wasn't the straw that broke the camel's back though. Petio's neighbors complained of a foul smell in the air accompanied by large packs of smoke bellowing from his house. Fearful of a chimney fire, French firemen arrived to the home to extinguish the fire. It would be upon their discovery that they were standing in a basement largely occupied by human remains. During the investigation, they also found more corpses in the backyard of the home. In the backyard, a pit was located to have quicklime in a canvas bag. Also out there would be more suitcases, clothing, and other possessions from the victims. During this time, it was time for Petio to hide from the Allies. One must be pretty bad to not be liked by both Nazis nor the Allies at the same time, including your own nation. He took a different name, now being addressed as Valerie, and he was actually drafted to join the hunt for himself. This didn't last long though, however, as he was recognized by someone at a Paris metro station. He had a pistol, money, and around 50 sets of identity documents. Petio was arrested again, this time by the French and not the Nazis. It was 1946 and the war in Europe was over. The circumstances were different this time around, as this time Petio stood before a court and not the interrogation from the Gestapo. Also, the court had the luggage from the victims as incriminating evidence of those who had been missing. It's as if he was running his own terrors in a one-man operation that mirrored the massive scale of what was happening in the Eastern camps. Petio's defense lawyer was one who was known for defending celebrities, and his attorney would explain to the jury that Petio was a hero, that these were simply enemies among the Germans, and Petio followed this narrative himself by lying, and he said he was working with the French resistance all along. There were many holes in this defense, as all the resistance names he mentioned could not be located, nor could he find one person to confirm his narrative. While Petio held his hero's portrayal, it seemed to have worked for an audience in the court as they gave a standing ovation. The jurors and judge felt differently. A defense attorney heard the judge and a few jurors talk in private of how much of a monster he was, and the attorney called for a mistrial. This was denied, and a few replacement jurors were brought in on the fifth day. The court did a tour of Petio's house with him present, and he remarked to the gossip of nearby neighbors. Peculiar homecoming, don't you think? He admitted to killing 19 of the 27 people located at his property. However, only under the guise that they were enemies. He also tried tricking the court that he was developing a new weapon but could not share the information as it could be used against France. 
His biggest argument was that he did indeed send people to South America with new identities, and that the remains around his home were those that he found were double agents or against the resistance. However, there were no evidence to any of the identified remains to confirm this. All of this failed to impress jurors and the judge. Also, bodies were being recovered from a river that would also be linked to him as well. Petio was sentenced to death. He refused to see a priest and said he would take his baggage with him. Petio was scheduled for execution the day his appeal was rejected. But the guillotine malfunctioned that morning, and it had to be postponed. A few days later, a portable guillotine arrived, and it was assembled by 3.30 a.m. on May 25th of 1946. Out from his cell, he would refuse a traditional glass of rum, but accepted a cigarette. For his wife's sake, he seen the priest and said, I am not a religious man, and my conscience is clean. He was described as walking calmly to the guillotine, described by one witness as if he were attending a regular day at work. Before his head entered the sliding board, Petio stated to those watching, Gentlemen, I ask you not to look. This will not be very pretty. The French media dubbed him as Dr. Satan, and at 5.05 a.m., a smiling face would tumble from the cutting table into a basket. He admitted to killing 63 people, but would not elaborate further. The official estimation of his murders remain unknown. His occupations were former abortionist, disbarred mayor, councilman of Yon, and former espionage agent. His pathology is being that of a poisoner, a con artist, a robber, a gangster, and most notoriously a serial killer. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video. Like and subscribe for more. If you enjoyed this video, leaving a like supports this small channel.